interview with Barry Garari, take number two. We were talking about um, your move to Warsaw, and you said that things changed dramatically at that point. Could you describe that a little? Well, I shouldn't say dramatically at that point. It was the beginning of a change. The change consisted of the fact that the circle of uh, followers of my grandfather's increased. Now, to some extent, that was exactly what he wanted, because he felt he had a message, a Torah message and a Hasidus message, that he wanted to con convey to a larger number of people. Uh, yet, it also meant that uh, there were many more newer adherents. At the beginning, this was a gradual change. Later on, when he would come to the United States, it was a major change. Methods of communication gradually also changed. I don't know exactly at what point. I'm, in a sense, outlining the process rather than telling you milestones. But uh, a rebbe generally does uh, there are three important functions that the Rebbe performs. There are many others, I'm sure. One is to convey the formal uh, message of Hasidus. Those are formal lectures called Ma'amarim in Hebrew. And they, uh, they are re regarded as God's voice speaking through the Rebbe. Secondly, there are talks, informal talks, in which the Rebbe recounts various events, puts his interpretation on them, and discusses things with his various followers. And then, of course, there is Yechidus, the one-on-one -on -one visit that many uh, that Hasidim make to the Rebbe in order to get advice. In the old days, the advice was in ways of worshiping the Almighty and improving one's moral condition, or one's moral performance, if you will. As the years went on, this changed. People began to ask the Rebbe for advice in earthly matters. Now, in those days, my grandfather was beginning to suffer from his illness. As I said already, he had multiple sclerosis. And so he, fre he frequently needed help. And on days when there were evenings when there would be, uh, when there would be uh, Yechidas, I would often be available to him. So. If he touched the little bell he had on his desk, uh, I could hear it and come to him to provide whatever assistance he needed. It often ended up with me listening for many hours while I was uh, sort of standing behind the back door to the room. I didn't listen so much to the every detail but I certainly got a very strong impression of the kind of discussions there were. And uh, I heard about the various unfortunate circumstances in which people found themselves, illness, lack of income, problems of various sorts. Anti-Semitism was such a prevalent force that it influenced everything Jews did at the time. And that made a very strong impression on me at the time, I remember. Obviously, people d who saw the Rebbe got a great deal of moral support from him. Advice, direction, moral support. And yet, there was also another aspect to it. I remember that once my grandmother was considering things very carefully, 
grandfather had told her that he had accumulated a substantial sum of money of his own. And he wanted to talk to her about how, what he should do. She probably wanted some things, what should be done with that and all that. You know, my grandmother considered it. She considered it very seriously because rarely did grandfather have any substantial amounts of money. By the time she made up her mind, it turned out that grandfather had had a few visitors at Yechidus. Some of them had complained that they had no income, they didn't have money to marry off a daughter, other problems of this sort, they were ill, and grandfather would open his drawer, give this one some money, give that one some money. By the time grandmother had made up her mind, there was nothing to worry about. There was no money left. <laughs> so in a sense, uh, people got support, which was moral guidance, moral support, and within the possibilities, financial support from the Rebbe. What was your relationship like with him? With whom? With your grandfather, the Rebbe. Uh, it's, uh, he was my, uh, in a very real sense, he was my leader, my, he was the man who, whose words always show the right direction. I was able always to show the right direction. There's often a saying uh, among Hasidim that every Hasid can have only one Rebbe. There is no replacement. And that's true here. But of course, as years go on, one's uh, attitude, one's own agenda changes. Mine changed in time. Now, uh, perhaps you should ask me at this stage what your next question is. I wanted you to describe your home in, in Warsaw. No, Who lived with course. you? What, where did you live? In Warsaw, as I remember, there was one street which was uh, part of the Jewish area called Nalevki. Nalevki was... Uh, uh, very readily recognizable on the Sabbath. Every store was closed. And the very, very, very rarely uh, open, uh, occasional open store would be surrounded by a whole throng who would be protesting. <laughs> on the Sabbath, it should be closed. On one side of that street, not too far from it, I don't know the exact, I don't remember the exact geography, was a city, a uh, uh, street called Novolipki. And we lived on Novolipki, I think it was number six. My grandfather lived at the other end of Nalevki, on Platz Muranovsky. Muranov, M-U-R-A-N-O, with an apostrophe over the O, W, is the Jewish, is a, was an important Jewish section of Warsaw at the time. And grandfather lived on Platz Muranovsky. I remember that we had a very nice home. We had nice furniture. My mother always had a feel for the elegant, and she always knew how to make a place warm. But we spent a great deal of time at my grandfather's house, of course. What about your religious education? Uh, religious education in those days for me was primarily with a tutor, Malamed, so-called. Now the word Malamed obviously means something even in English because there are so many Jews named Malamed <laughs> or various versions of that. That means a teacher. I had a number of them. None of them really stick in my mind as being that uh, that outstanding that I would remember the names. But that was, where I that was where I learned my Hebrew. I didn't get very much education on the, on the secular side. Uh, later on, in later years, we moved out of, uh, of uh, Warsaw to Atvotsk. Atvotsk was a spa about 20 or 30 miles from Warsaw. 
And we moved there because grandfather's condition was getting worse, and it was thought that it would be better if he lived in a place where, uh, which, which had a particularly good climate. Now, mm, I'm sorry, you asked me a question. I was trying to answer it in a roundabout way. I was asking you about your education. My ed education, yes. Later on, when we moved to Wars to Otvotsk, uh, I ended up going to the yeshiva. Again, I had a tutor. Uh, I was treated differently than the other kids were. Not always, by the way, to my advantage. In many ways, I wish I had been treated more like them. But uh, I had a tutor, or in later years, somebody a young man about my age, with whom we were just uh, partners, in a sense, in the study. And so I studied there. Occasionally, I had some tutoring in, uh, in Russian. It didn't take. See, the, one of the problems is that uh, the language problem. I started out in life speaking Russian, because that was the language, and of course Yiddish and, of course, the written Hebrew, because that's the language of the prayers. Uh, I continued in Latvia. I tried to learn Latvian. Latvian is a very unusual language. It's one of a group of only two such languages, the Baltic languages, which contain Latvian and, the, and Lithuanian. And uh, by now, I retain very few words in that language. I didn't learn that much of it because in the circle in which I was involved, Russian was still paramount, and so was Yiddish. There was no need for that language. We moved to Poland. In Poland, I did learn Polish. I still remember a little bit of it here and there because I also learned some of the Polish literature. But uh, that was about the extent of my secular education. I should describe for you a little bit the yeshiva in Otvotsk. Now, what I'm jumping to is the period after the family left Warsaw and we now settled in Otvotsk. Otvotsk is spelled O-T-W-O-C-K, but the C is pronounced always as a T-Z in Polish. <coughs> Atwatsk was a relatively smaller town. I mean, not Warsaw was, of course, the center of Poland. Atwatsk was probably, I would guess, about 20,000 people. It was primarily a spa for people who had tuberculosis. And uh, I, uh, the yeshiva moved there. I don't know why. I, I think it was a very bad move bad decision from a health point of view. <coughs> Tuberculosis is a highly contagious disease. In those days, there was no cure for it. <coughs> and there was a lack of understanding also of how to avoid uh, infection. <coughs> but what happened was that the yeshiva ended up renting a house with a large tract of land around it. Actual space in the house was not that, not that much. And so the dormitory consisted of beds stacked one next to the other, touching. Rarely was there a good passage. You often had to walk on one bed in order to get to the other one. There was no plumbing. There was very little water that was piped into the building. There was no water pressure available from the town. What had to be done was that the, uh, that the superintendent and his wife had to pump up the water manually into a tank on the roof. So obviously very small quantities of it were used. And you could see them working hard maybe a total of eight hours a day pumping water. I'm talking about him four hours and her four hours. 
which is a, a back-breaking task, really. This was a big wheel, and you had to stand there and turn it. Turn it. The toilets were outhouses, smelly outhouses. There were no bathrooms. There was no facilities for washing, except for a mikveh, a ritual bath. In this kind of environment, it is no great surprise that there was a proliferation of bedbugs and lice. You could often sit at the table and study, and then you would see lice crawling on the covers of people or on their hair. Not very pleasant. Those young people were undernourished. There wasn't enough of food. There was no money for food. I was one of the rich guys, you know. When I got home, I got food. They often didn't. You would get one warm meal. The one warm meal would consist of a plate of bouillon uh, and maybe a little piece of chicken swimming in it. Very often the bouillon was mostly water. So that kind of a food, that kind of a life, and the presence of uh, tubercular patients around led to frequent infections. And some of the people came down with it. And it was very, very rare that they completely uh, recovered. Well, I'll probably be switching back and forth. What was your home like in Otsvatsk? My grandfather, there was a, a large house that uh, was owned by a broker, Mr. Berlin. He was a broker of some kind. I'm not sure what he brokered. But he used to live in Warsaw, and this was really a property that was more or less an investment property. There were uh, several buildings on that property. There was a main house. There was a secondary building. Then there was a garage with an apartment over it for the janitor. And then there was a small store with an apartment over it for the store owner. The store was a general store. The garage held a car that uh, hadn't seen the road in many years. It was more mostly a showpiece. But uh, the large house had four apartments and a few spare rooms. The ground floor was my grandfather's. One half of it was his apartment. It consisted of a bedroom, a library, a dining room, a small porch, and a kitchen. It had one bathroom, and one toilet. It also had a large veranda, probably 30 feet long along the side of the house. And some of the pictures you see of my grandfather's earlier years were taken on that veranda. Grandfather would often sit on it and work there. There was a, almost a mirror image of that on the other s of that apartment on the other side. It consisted of my grandfather's study, my grandfather's secretariat, a room for a shul or a congregation, and a veranda. And uh, in addition to this, we now that describes the lower floor where my grandfather lived. On the upper floor, there were two major apartments. One was Mr. Berlin's, which he used on occasional weekends, and the other one was a Mr. K, who lived there. Uh, apparently, I would suggest that with his wife and with his girlfriend, and who was a TB sufferer. And Mr. K would often spend his time on the front lawn trying to get the fresh air. And he would cough. He was reasonably careful. He would spit it into a little spittoon that he held. 
But nevertheless, I am not so sure that this was in accordance with uh, modern standards. I don't think we would have taken, uh, we would have exposed the visiting public that readily to that, because occasionally he did spit on the ground. And of course, there are air, uh, airborne infections. Now, the, the secondary building was the one in which we lived. And the apartment in which we lived, at one time that entire building was one building, then it was subdivided into several, and uh, into several apartments, and then we had one apartment. And of course, since there were several apartments there, what we needed was a, an electric meter for each of the apartments. Now, it so happened we didn't have an electric meter. An electric meter would have cost about 70 zlotis, as I remember. And somebody, somehow everybody thought that that was much too much money. So we just used candles. It was, a, it was an interesting period. It was not... Uh, I often ended up actually sleeping in my grandfather's apartment. I forgot now for what reason. Not so much in his own apartment as in his study. Uh, grandfather's study and the, uh, the room of his secretariat and his library, various places I used to sleep. And there were lots of books there. So after I went to bed and got under the covers, I would pull out a flashlight, get a book, pull a uh, blanket over my head, and read. And so I ended up reading the old Hebrew literature and some of the modern Hebrew literature, like Bialik, and various other modern Hebrew writers, etc., etc. Literature which might not have been normally handed to me intentionally, but it gave me a much broader picture of the world. What other kinds of things did you read? Did you read any secular literature? Probably. I learned to read Polish. And so occasionally I would get hold of a Polish newspaper. I certainly, I, I read, um, I certainly read uh, some of the poetry of Adam Mickiewicz. <coughs> I read uh, various other poems. As a tego króla Jana, co to pobach był pogana, przyszli posły rozjemcy, ratuj królu, ginu Niemcy. That's a poem, I think, by Czarska, which I still remember. She, Hendrik, Hendrik, Hendrik Sienkiewicz, various other writers. I don't know to what extent it was formal, to what extent it was informal, but uh, it was interesting. But I never learned many of the other subjects, like I never learned, for example, geography, uh, or, sh or various other subjects that one should know. So my education was somewhat uh, cockeyed, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> what do you remember about your grandfather's library? What did it smell like? Well, in those days, my grandfather's library was probably several thousand books, not that much, not that, ma not that many, probably 10,000 at most, if that. And it smelled, uh, well, the very old books, of course, uh, tend to be partly decayed. So they have an odor. Uh, the older they are, the more authoritative they, they say, you might think they are. Grandfather also had other interests. Uh, he often liked to keep track of what opponents did. So I found in his library, for example, copies of uh, uh, the Bible written in Latin. So it's not the Hebrew Bible. Or uh, copies of the Bible, I should say, excuse me, uh, the Hebrew Bible translated into Latin, but with comments by various priests. So he could see which way things were going. 
He continued that particular interest in his, libra his librarian secretary, his librarian private secretary, Chaim Lieberman, who managed to get to this country and lived to the age of about 100. So, but he used to bring him, every Friday he would bring grandfather a new box of books. And in his free time, grandfather would study it. Nothing pleased him more than reading. And that was one of his great, great pleasures. I contracted that disease to some extent. <laughs> so I also loved to read. What else did you enjoy as a young boy? Being bad. In what way? Uh, well, in various, in various little ways. But then there were the more serious matters. Poland was a virulently anti-Semitic country. We lived at one end of Fatwatsk. The yeshiva was at the other end. By the time I had to go, for, every day I had to go from home to the yeshiva and then back. Now there were two ways of going. Going on foot, which was what most people did, or going on a bicycle, which bad guys did. I managed to acquire a bicycle. The roads were mostly unpaved. There were a few paved streets. Uh, we were at the intersection. Our house was at the intersection of Ulica Boleslava Prusa. That's the name of a famous Polish uh, poet. And uh, Ulica Doktora Cybulskiego. I don't know what his achievements were, but his street was not paved. So it was a sea of mud in the rainy season. As we would walk up Prusa, we would pass the Tarmsi, which was in town. Then I had to take, I think, a right and then so on. And we would walk by the church. And almost invariably, when a Jewish boy walked by there, there would be a few rocks going thrown his way. And I remember one day going there, and there was more than a few rocks thrown at him. One of them hit me in the glasses, penetrated my cheek. It was obviously sharp, and it was infuriating. It broke my glasses. Well, as I say, I had been a bad boy. When I would ride the bike, I needed protection against dogs. So what I did was to buy little uh, guns, a gun, which would be a pop gun to just make noise, but not have no bullets. I had two such guns. <laughs> and one of them I had drilled through. So it could put a shot to something. I pulled out the wrong one, and I shot the guy who had thrown the, the, the rocks at me. Well, I got him in the neck. A Jew was not supposed to do those things. A Jew was supposed to turn tail and run in Poland. So what I did was very infuriating. There were quite a number of servants. And there was a, a pogrom was in the making. After that, I was in hiding for a couple of weeks. We found that the police chief, somebody found that the police chief did take money. The police chief finally managed to explain it away. Of course, after he took a sufficient amount of money. And there was no program. And approximately when was that? 37, 38, somewhere in that vicinity. How did your family react to all of this? Oh, I was a baddie. I was a baddie, no question about it. I built a chayyot. <laughs> of course. You said you were in hiding for a while. Where were you? I was in hiding, actually, in Centos, uh, among the uh, among the kids who were uh, among the retarded kids. Did I already discuss Centos? Not. No. Not on the tape, but okay. I will, we'll discuss I will that on the next tape. Okay, I will discuss that in the next tape.